This is Megapine. Megapine. M I P. With Masamela Mafuma. Mark Thompson. Megapine. Get woke. Do you ever feel like life is a never ending series of lessons while you try to find purpose, meaning, and answers? I am Vanessa Fontana, the host of Figuring Shit Out, a podcast where we undertake self help, coming of age, and healing. As I live my 20s in New York City, figuring shit out myself, I've realized that if you spend your whole life trying to get your act together, you don't have a life, you have an act. On Figuring Shit Out, every Sunday, you get to normalize the journey of not knowing and be guided into living your life with more intention and ease. Ladies and gentlemen, jobs report for November 2023. And of course, who better to talk to than the chief economist, our dear friend with the Senate on Budget and Policy Priorities, Chad Stone. Chad, how are you, man? Happy December. Happy December. Uh, I'm doing well, Mark. Hope you are too. I am. I am quite well, as a matter of fact. 199,000 jobs added. So this is not an... uh, a breaking news or groundbreaking report. We're still even, Stephen, aren't we? This is a good jobs report. The 199,000 jobs that you mentioned is, is from the payroll side. As I always like to remind listeners, uh, the, the jobs report number comes from two different surveys. The survey of employers asking how many payroll jobs do you have as no jobs. And the uh, survey of households asks people in the household, what's the labor force status of people in the household working, not working, actively looking for a job and therefore counted as unemployed. And last month we had a, we had a decent payroll jobs report, but we had a pretty disappointing household jobs report. And this month we got a correction on the household side. It was quite robust. So if we average what happened this month with what happened last month, we're seeing relatively healthy household side and the payroll side is also healthy. So the the job market is still doing well. And how much does that have to do, we've talked about this before too, in terms of what the Fed's role has been. Um, Now, again, there was, it was a little bit more on average last year, that's gone down a little bit, but as you've written, that has to do with some of the Fed tightening, right? To to flesh out the, the payroll report, which we pay a lot of attention to in terms of how the job market is doing, as you said, 199,000 jobs added in November, but the change in September was revised down from 35,000, from a very robust 297,000 to 262,000, and October remained at 150,000. So as a result, payroll employment is 4.7 million jobs higher than in February 2020. So that's a very strong recovery. Um, but uh, no buts, really. It's, a, it's ongoing. Now, you asked about the Fed. Miraculously so far, we're having the kind of soft landing in the economy that um, we hoped for, but we're sure we could expect. With the Fed, when the Fed was tightening, normally you think that a tightening Fed means that you're going to um, lead. It's going to lead to job losses and and possibly precipitate a recession. And that was a concern because the Fed raised a lot, but um, inflation has come down. And the job market has stayed healthy, which is a pretty great result with low unemployment, still solid job creation. To, to just keep up with the growth in the working age population, you only need 100,000 or fewer jobs. And we got almost twice that. So that's still a good, a very good job, job payroll report. And the unemployment rate went down a little bit too, didn't it? Yep. It was, every, everything was good on the household side. Employment number of people who said, who responded to the survey, it's a survey, the results of the survey, the number of people with a job increased by 747,000. The number of people who were unemployed fell by 215,000. So the overall labor force increased by 532,000. That's a big increase in the size of the labor force, a healthy increase. And the number of people not in the labor force because they, they don't want to be working mostly now fell by 352,000. So people are still coming into the job market and there are jobs for them. That's what this report said. Some in media are suggesting that the Fed will still cut rates, especially after the first of the year. What are your thoughts about that? Okay, the Fed meets on 
Tuesday and Wednesday. Their announcement will be on Wednesday about what they're going to do this month. And everybody is saying they're going to keep rates where they are. Okay. You know, speculation about when they will start cutting rates. But to date, Fed Chair Powell has been saying he was he's been indicating that they're not they're not necessarily going to be cutting rates soon. Um, especially since the job market is still performing strongly. The job market is one thing that's responding well, but the high interest rates are affecting people's borrowing and, and things like that. That's, that can be an issue. But maybe I, I'm not a very good Fed pro prognosticator because it's about the future. And as Yogi Berra said, <laughs> the prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. You're right about that. Very well put with the yogiism. But the bottom line is things have still been going well and going well since February 2020. Consistently, we have been coming out of the COVID recession. November 2023, no different. I know we don't predict the future, but I think we also can uh, hypothesize when we come back after the first of the year, there's holiday employment. That always is a factor. So things shouldn't be much different come January. No, probably not. It might be a little more cooling, but it might be held up. Yeah. The, I, I think we have to say that we're out of the recession uh, in terms of the, yeah. in terms of the jobs market. We're the, the, the total improvement, what did I say? 4.7 um, mm -hmm. million from with me, with me that, wait a minute, I'm going to get that. What's that? I think I got that. Um, but in any case, we're yeah, all, I'm looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. We're 4.7 million jobs higher than in February 2020. In other words, we've not just closed the gap that opened in the pandemic, but we've gotten back on the path that the economy would have been growing on had it not been for the pandemic, the, the full employment path. So that's really a, pretty much a, a very solid recovery in, in payroll employment. And yeah. the unemployment rate has been four or lower for two years. Yeah, yeah. This is not a, a chance, not, nonpartisan and nonpolitical folks, but some of you listening probably, as Chad brings us this objective news, these are just numbers. These are the numbers. It seems like people still don't know it or something. I don't know. People, oh, the economy, we, I mean, like, but these are the numbers. So I'm not, it, it's, perception truly is reality. I'm not sure what, what people are, <laughs> are looking at when they complain about jobs or what is and what isn't, but these are real numbers. We look, and you're always good at, at breaking down all the numbers, so when we look at the demographics, you've even had, not a lot, two-tenths of a percentage point going down for African-American unemployment since February 2020. No change in African-American unemployment since October, and not much of a change in white either, two-tenths of a percentage point in October, Hispanic, two-tenths of a percentage point, Asian went up four-tenths of a percentage point. What's interesting though, looking at your calculations, African-American unemployment between February 2020 and November 2023, not a lot, but it's still there. African-American unemployment is the only unemployment rate that has gone down since February 2020. Everybody has gone up by some tenth of a percentage point, not a lot. Yeah. What a, That's what interesting. It, it, it's interesting, but we want to be careful because the demographic unemployment rates have smaller, uh, the, white, the white unemployment still has a big simple sample size, but the other right. have smaller sample sizes. And so that they fluctuate somewhat due to um, margin of error considerations. But, but you're right that, that black unemployment, it's still, it, it's at its best is still high, higher than it should be. Right, right. But compared to history, it's at a relatively low level. It was just, be, it was in February, 2020, and it is now too, at, compared to its own history at a low level, but its own history is one of high unemployment, usually twice the white rate. Why is there such a difference, do we know, Chad, in the sample size? 
Oh, the 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 uh, household survey that that from which the data is collected is, I think, only sixty five thousand households or some something like that, and therefore the number of black households in the survey are is fairly small, much smaller than the number of white households in the survey. And the smaller the sample that you have, the, the bigger the variance is likely to be, the more variation there is to be. It's, it's a statistical phenomenon. It's nothing more than that. Because they try to have a sample that is representative of the population. That, uh, and, and then the, it's the outcomes that are... So, so there's a this certain number of black families in the sample that is representative of the proportion of black households in the population. Um, but the employment status is can is, isn't constant over time and and it changes in ways that that that, uh, that produce variation in the, in the survey it's not has nothing to do with the people it has to do with the survey that some sometimes it captures uh, one one aspect and sometimes another for small sample sizes it's we're used to thinking oh margin of error around the uh, presidential polls and things like that but but and those can fluctuate too because those are not huge sample sizes but the overall population the overall household population measures also are subject to a fairly right. yeah a surprisingly wide vari- variation you don't want to look up the statistics that PL, PLS gives you on how wide the confidence interval is to, to make sure it captures 90% of the, and anyway i'm sorry I'm too long i uh, statistical discussion. You know, that's right. We need to understand that. And these revisions down, we, we always touch on that 35,000 down from September. But by what we look at normally, that's not a big revision, is it? No. And it's September's number that's revised. October's not been revised. Yeah, but to, to be it absolutely un, unrevised is is more rare than not because <laughs> companies, I'm sorry, establishment, business establishments who are in the survey have three months to get their data. And so they don't necessarily, in other words, not everybody reported their right. September data in September or even in October. Maybe. But now that, now that, that it, it's all mo- mostly all in, as soon as September um, change as a result yeah. of, of new data coming in. October, we'll, we'll have another month to, October just happened to be no more change. Uh, that's very abnormal, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it is abnormal, for sure. Folks, the latest in the jobs numbers. Chad, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but d- did you get a chance, because you and I usually try to touch on state and local any new anything yeah state and local government employment was one of the bigger gainers in the month really no it had there was still a lot of room for improvement in state and local okay okay and then but and but it's getting it's getting close and leisure and hospitality is back almost to where it was before right. the pandemic but it's or the gains are concentrated in food and in eating and drinking establishments not an accommodation, which is a, the other big piece, because we're still seeing less travel, and less. Um, no, we're seeing more than we were seeing, but we're not back to the same levels as before the pandemic. So the improvement in leisure and hospitality is real overall, but it's concentrated in eating and drinking places. Less travel, but as Chad and I were talking before we just came on, plane tickets still cost a million dollars each way. But then it's the holidays too, so that's what happens. And it's funny, you and I have been talking about this so long, the ways in which, at least for me, you come up in some of my daily comings and goings. I was in an Uber, what's today? I was in an Uber day before yesterday. And you just strike up a conversation with whoever the driver is. And the young lady said to me that she's actually a bus driver in the school system. And... But she told me she has, she herself has not gone back to work yet. 
And we've talked about that in the, in folks, as we, if you've been listening to us over time, state and local often has a lot to do with education. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I think we're still seeing everybody has still been slow to come back. I even know some substitute teachers who are practically permanent. All right. They're still at school. So I think that what I heard her say, I thought about myself. So I wonder if this is one of the people that affects Chad's our monthly numbers when we talk. I was just wondering about that. Statistically, yes. Yeah. Not necessarily that particular person, but people like that person, yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. I said, this young lady doesn't even know she's, she plays in our numbers in our conversation. So folks, this is, it's good news we are where we were in February 2020. This is a different kind of recession. Uh, nobody in particular's fault. But folk coming back pretty consistently. Do, let me, I've never asked you this before, but when we see these types of numbers, if there's someone listening who's wondering, maybe I want to get back out here, who's not made that decision yet, are these the kind of numbers that ought to be encouraging for someone to get to re-enter? Yeah, the fact that we only left the jobs, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, of course, as we keep saying, lived experience, and if they're lived experiences, they're having trouble finding a job. But if they're thinking they'll have trouble finding a job and not looking, they're probably making a mistake. Yeah. Y'all heard it from Chad, folks. Sit on budget.org, Chad Stone. Chad, and we'll talk again in January, as we all know. We'll look and see what those numbers are. Those should be very interesting. I'm always curious about holiday, un- holiday employment. Chad, as always, we appreciate you. Happy holidays to you. Thank you, and to you too. Do you ever feel like life is a never-ending series of lessons while you try to find purpose, meaning, and answers? I am Vanessa Fontana, the host of Figuring Shit Out, a podcast where we undertake self-help, coming of age, and healing. As I live my 20s in New York City, figuring shit out myself, I've realized that if you spend your whole life trying to get your act together, you don't have a life. You have an act. On Figuring Shit Out, every Sunday, you get to normalize the journey of not knowing and be guided into living your life with more intention and ease. Ladies and gentlemen, the jobs numbers still looking pretty good coming out of the recession brought about by COVID. And then there are some good signs for African-American employment. We want to hear about that from the senior advisor to the president, the intergovernmental relations liaison for the president. And obviously he misses his former role as Secretary of Labor. So that's why he's going to talk to us a bit about jobs today. You all will recall on this show, when he was Secretary of Labor, he was a very regular guest, especially when the jobs report came out. Tom Perez joins us once again on Make It Plain. Tom, how are you? I'm doing great. It is always a pleasure to be with you and all of your listeners and viewers. Thank you, Tom. What's the administration's take on the latest jobs numbers, especially as they relate to African-American employment? This is another really solid report. Uh, Last month, there were 199,000 jobs created. Uh, If you look at the entirety of the Biden administration, over 14 million jobs created. The unemployment rate has now been under 4% for almost two years in a row, which is the longest stretch in over 50 years. You asked about the African-American unemployment rate. When President Biden took over, it was 9.2%. Now it's 5.8%. And the gap between white and black employment fell to a record low. In other words, If our unemployment rate, our our current unemployment rate is 3.7% nationally, our black unemployment rate is 5.8%. We want that gap to be zero. We want the black unemployment rate ideally to get to 3.7%. And we're moving in the right direction uh, because the gap was yawning during preceding years. So it's a very solid report, pretty broad reaching gains in healthcare and other middle-class industries. And I'm just, I'm really, there's a lot of momentum here and we've got to keep it up because I know for a lot of folks, they're still struggling and nobody here at the White House spikes the football because we know that there's still more work to do, but we're a heck of a lot better off than we were 
at the beginning of 2021. Certainly, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Tom, the African-American unemployment rate is actually the only one that's gone down in this current November 2023 report. The African-American unemployment rate is the only one that has gone down since February 2020. Not a lot, two-tenths of a percentage point, but it's still gone down. Do you feel that the American people are feeling that this has been a steady recovery? Are, are they, is, is that showing up in the way that it should amongst the American people? We still have more work to do. I'm proud of where we've come. You look at some of the data and it's really impressive in, in terms of, let, let me just give you a few examples. Black uh, Americans are starting small businesses in record numbers. The president set a goal of increasing by 50% the number of federal contracting dollars going to small disadvantaged businesses by 2025. And uh, this past year, a record amount, $70 billion in federal contracts were awarded to small disadvantaged businesses. And Black businesses were front and center in, in those awards. And it's exciting to see that there is progress. You look at overall wealth of, um, of African-Americans and it has been uh, moving up and that is really exciting. At the same time though, a lot of people aren't feeling it and that's not lost on me. It's not lost on the president. It's not lost on uh, Vice President Harris. And so we have to uh, continue these efforts. That's why, for instance, if you're a, a black uh, senior and you got diabetes, and as diabetes disproportionately affects the black community, we have capped, thanks to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we've capped insulin costs at 35 bucks a month. It used to be, in some cases, tenfold uh, and even more. And these are the things that we continue to work on. And, and my bottom line is this uh, we know we have more work to do. At the same time, I think it's important to understand what the moral compass is. What's the North Star of your leaders? And for Joe Biden, someone who grew up in a decidedly middle-class setting in central Pennsylvania, he wants to know, can people feed their family? Can they live a life of dignity? Can they uh, go to the store and get groceries? Do they not have to? We don't want anyone to choose between your food and your rent or your medicine and your rent. This is what Joe Biden's North Star is. And, and we're making real progress as we climbed out of this recession. More to do, uh, but look at the trend data. It speaks for itself. In terms of more to do, can you highlight some of the things that, that you're thinking about as we go forward in 2024? What more would you and the administration like to get done? We're going to continue to take on big pharma to lower prescription drug costs. The folks who didn't like the fact that under the Inflation Reduction Act, we established a number of prescription drugs that we were going to negotiate for lower prices on. They took us to court on that. And, and you know, we're moving forward because we won those cases. So I want to see more drugs become affordable. That's what Joe Biden wants to do. And he's working on that. We want to continue to expand the, the the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare. It's just remarkable to me to hear Donald Trump talk about repealing Obamacare again. We've been to that movie and Obamacare has been a lifesaver for so many people. So what Joe Biden wants to do is expand it. There's still too many states where, and they happen to be states like Texas and Florida with governors like Abbott and DeSantis, who don't seem to care about whether people especially middle and low income people have access to health care. And so we've got to expand health care coverage in those communities as well. And that's that's those are examples of the unfinished business. We've got to implement. Here's the good news. There are so many important provisions that have been passed under the bipartisan infrastructure bill, for instance, and we've begun implementing but we are we have so much more work to do. So 
communities across the country, for instance, are going to get access to clean drinking water. We saw Flint, Michigan, and what happened there. That was unconscionable. And thanks to Joe Biden, across the country, we're going to address the Flint problem by replacing lead-infested pipes with clean pipes. We're going to make sure that everybody has access to broadband, high-speed internet that's affordable. Uh, If you don't have internet, you can't live your life. Your kids can't do their homework. They can't access classes if they have to go remote. If you need health care and you live in rural America, telemedicine is what you need. And so these are examples of things that the president wants to do. Eisenhower has built the, the, the highway system, and Joe Biden is building the information highway system with the Internet. But then, too, we also know some of the brick-and-mortar projects that are coming with infrastructure. I've been reading with great interest all of the press about perhaps upgrading our rail system along the Northeast Corridor high-speed rail, even every country in the world seems to have it, even some less developed than ours. But if you, and if you do all of that, including the lead pipes, including the other infrastructure matters, those two create more jobs. All of those projects create more jobs, don't they? And they create good, usually union jobs that pay a middle-class wage. And you look at the broad data on the union movement, When the union movement succeeds, America succeeds. When the union movement succeeds, the middle class grows. And in particular, Mark, and you and I have had this conversation before, and it bears repeating. When the union movement succeeds, Black America disproportionately succeeds because we have so many unions where Black people have very high representation. And so that's why, that's one of many reasons why I love the union movement and these infrastructure problem projects are going to continue that growth in union density and in black middle class job creation. Now that you mentioned it, Tom, just last night, Sunday night, I was honored to MC Bill Lucy's 90th birthday party. And of course, as you all know, founded the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. It was a who's who in the room of union and organized labor in America. And one of the themes was the successes of organized labor this year, much of which came as a result of of strikes. I find it interesting that there have been so many labor strikes this year with a a pro-labor president, but yet it doesn't seem as if it was any political cost to the president. He went out there and actually stood with some of the unions, UAW in particular. So how do you all react to that? There have been strikes. You all have stood with the unions. What are your thoughts about the way this year has gone for unions and the labor movement? I'll tell you, the the public perceptions of the union movement have never been greater than they are now. Or to be slightly more precise, it's been at least 50 years. I don't want to say never, okay? Because I haven't looked. Uh, I haven't looked to never. But we see public support for labor unions at a huge, at least in my lifetime and your lifetime, they're at uh, the highest levels. And, and why is that? Because people recognize that collective power means collective success. And you look at the auto industry, the UAW, you look at uh, the Teamsters, you look at the West Coast ports, you look at actors and actresses and, and people who are building the sets, you, they're The union movement is, they just, in Louisiana, they just successfully organized, had a a successful union organizing campaign down there. There was a successful campaign recently down in Georgia. These are places that have not historically, Mark, been very hospitable to labor. And I think this is wonderful. And Joe Biden is the first sitting president in U.S. history to walk a picket line. That's amazing. The AFL-CIO one of their senior leaders, the first time they've had a Black person in that high a position in senior leadership. So the AFL-CIO recognizes that diversity is their strength. Diversity is both their present and their future. And that is, as someone who grew up in Buffalo, New York, and Buffalo is a union town, it warms the cockles of my heart. And I'm one of the many reasons I'm proud to work for Joe Biden 
is because he'll always have the back of the union votes. Right, folks. Tom Perez, senior vice for the president and director of intergovernmental affairs. Tom, we thank you for joining us as always on Make It Plain. Good to see you, buddy. Great to see you, Mark, and great to be with you and all of your listeners and viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, happy to have with us a big announcement for HBCUs and other institutions. We hear all about it from the Undersecretary of the Department of Education, James Qual. Mr. Secretary, how are you? I'm great. How are you today? Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you. Tell us about this big news. Yeah, so we were making $93 million investment in colleges and universities that are committed to being inclusive and serving communities that otherwise might not have opportunities to go on to college. We're really excited about this step toward this present vision of a higher education system that serves everybody. And so what will some of this money be allocated for? We have two main initiatives. One is we are building up the research and development infrastructure at historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions. And we want to make sure that we're benefiting from the perspectives of scholars at those institutions and also that we're leveraging their ability to serve populations that other colleges and universities don't reach and help them go on to contribute in STEM and other fields. The other big investment we're making is in helping more students complete and helping colleges do the things that we know students need in order to finish their degree. And you mentioned research and development. This is a part of the research and development infrastructure. And again, we're talking about HBCUs, TCCUs, for those who don't know, that's tribally controlled colleges and universities and MSIs, minority serving institutions. Can you highlight some of the schools that you all have chosen to award grants to? Yeah, we're excited. Uh, for example, we're giving a grant to Tennessee State University, and that's going to establish a, a center of biomedical sciences there. We're giving funding to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore to create something called the Futures Institute to recruit students, professors, and mentors to help build up the research enterprise there. And we're making similar enterprises at a total of 11 other HBCUs, tribal colleges, and minority serving institutions. And tell us more about how this came about and why now. I know I, you mentioned the commitment that Biden-Harris administration has, but how long has this been on the table? How did it evolve? Yeah, this is something that the president has wanted to do from the outset. And he talked on the campaign trail about the need to invest in HBCUs and other minority serving institutions, and particularly in building up the research capacity of these institutions that have been underfunded for so long. And it's funding that we've been fighting for. It's part of an overall investment in $25 billion that we've made in these kinds of institutions so far. And really, critical to the president's vision that colleges and universities need to be open to everyone and promote upward mobility and, and help everyone get a fair opportunity to earn a degree and get a better job. And how does this timetable work? Does, do these types of grants, are they implemented? Are they awarded immediately? Yeah, we're announcing the award now. The funding will be ready to go as colleges and universities start to implement these programs. And obviously, too, these are also fields that are becoming more and more relevant, aren't they, when it comes to the world and work and opportunity, right? Yeah, we see the economy has never been changing more quickly. And we're trying to invest in industries of the future, like clean energy, cybersecurity, biomedicine. And these types of industries are going to need workers with all kinds of credentials from advanced degrees to community college degrees and certificates. And we want to make sure that we're creating all of those opportunities for people because we're going to need all of those people to build our economy of the future. I'll get in trouble if I don't also acknowledge you named some of the schools, but folks, Hampton is receiving a grant, Southern as well, Texas Southern 
also United Tribes Technical College, Blackfeet Community College, uh, here where I am in New York, a City College of New York, among others. So this is good news. And I know that as a product of HBCUs myself and my children as products of HBCUs, this is no small thing. It's a big deal. I'll have you know, Mr. Secretary, my grandfather graduated from Tennessee State University in 1933. My wow. grandmother graduated from Tennessee State University in 1935. You're very close to home. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I had an opportunity to go down and visit at Tennessee State and meet with some of the um, future teachers and uh, some of the future agricultural studies students have some sense for what a special place that is. Is there any chance that this will continue while the administration continues to serve? Are there other grants that you will all be looking to award, award over time to other institutes as well? We are, we are going to continue to try and invest in in the places that are creating opportunity for as long as President Biden's in office. And I think these grants, the people who were awarded grants should be proud of that. These were very competitive competitions. We had many times more good applications than we were able to fund. And I think that puts us in a strong position to go to Congress and say, there's a lot more work to be done here. Indeed. James Quall, ladies and gentlemen, the Undersecretary of Education telling us about $93 billion total in grants to support research and development at HBCUs, TCCUs, and MSIs, and post-secondary completion for underserved students. Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us today on Make It Plain. Thank you, Reverend. There was a pleasure. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. As always, perform an act of kindness on behalf of an elder or young person. Write a letter to a sister or brother who just so happens to find her or himself incarcerated. Offer libations to the ancestors upon whose sturdy shoulders we all now stand. And above all, give thanks to the God of your understanding by whatever name you call her and him. All God asks of us is that we give each other love. Thanks for giving MIP love. And please remember to subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain.